So uh, I imagine that, uh, like many of you, every once in a while, uh, I ask the big question. Are we alone in the universe? Is there life on other planets? And if there is, what does that life look like? Does it look anything like life here on Earth, or does it look uh, completely different? We don't have an answer to that question yet, so for the moment, we're limited to uh, studying what Chris Langton referred to as life as it is. We have one data point, one instance of the evolution uh, of life, and we can create things like this phylogenetic tree, understand the relationships between the different species uh, here on Earth. But uh, imagine for a moment that we did discover life on another planet, and we were able to investigate it in enough detail that we could reconstruct the relationships between species on that planet and draw a second tree of life for that planet. Perhaps we discover a third life-bearing planet, we create another tree of life and another tree of life and another tree of life. And if we continue, we can now look across these different trees of life. We can look at this forest of life and investigate not just life as it is here on, life, on Earth, but life uh, as it can be. How does life tend to evolve given the opportunity uh, to do so? So again, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, so in my group, uh, instead of looking for other worlds, uh, we try and tackle this question uh, here on Earth by creating virtual worlds. And as you'll see in this video uh, as it starts up, what we do is to create a virtual world that looks very much like a modern uh, video game and we then apply a evolutionary simulation to that virtual world, and we fill that virtual world with initially a population of relatively simple creatures, and we challenge them to evolve a particular ability, which here is the ability uh, to move forward. And as you can see already early on in this evolutionary run, some of these robots are not doing uh, a very good job, and others are managing to hobble on uh, as best they can. So now our evolutionary simulation comes into this population and culls from the population or removes from the population those that don't do a very good job at uh, moving forward and makes modified copies of those virtual creatures that remain by simulating genetic mutation and sexual recombination so that these new child robots that are produced look similar to but are slightly different from uh, their parent robots. And most of those new robots, because they're the result of random mutation, don't do a very good job at walking. But every once in a while, one of them moves a little bit faster than the rest in the population and puts those in danger of being culled from the population. We run uh, these virtual worlds on uh, UVM's resident supercomputer, the Vermont Advanced Computing Core. We run them for hours and days. Uh, and if we're lucky, we're able to evolve something that is sufficiently interesting that we might go to the extra effort of actually manuf manufacturing a physical version of it. So as you can see in the video at the top, uh, in this particular evolutionary simulation, we found a robot uh, that's moving forward. It's using a, an interesting gait, not quite something you see uh, in nature. Um, so we found this sufficiently interesting that we went ahead and built a physical version of it. You can see that in the video uh, below. And again, if we're lucky, that physical robot will do something similar to what we saw its virtual counterpart evolve to do. So uh, the ultimate goal here is an engineering goal. We want to borrow ideas from biology. We want to borrow ideas specifically from evolutionary biology to help us build better and more capable and more adaptive uh, robots. Uh, we already have robots. We have industrial robots that have been built directly by humans, by engineers. Uh, it turns out building industrial robots is uh, simple by comparison because an industrial robot is free to do exactly the same thing over and over again. If we want our robots to leave the factories and help us here in the real world, these robots are going to have to not just be capable but also to be adaptive. Uh, as biological organisms ourselves, we're very good at adapting what we do as the real world around us is constantly changing. So as biological evolution produced adaptive machines, we're hoping that computational evolution combined with these virtual worlds and physical robots can produce not just capable physical robots, but also uh, adaptive robots. 
So that's the engineering aim, um, but there's also a biological aim. So coming back to the phylogenetic tree that I showed you at the beginning, that was a phylogenetic tree of the history of life. And in the extraterrestrial life example, if we had a whole bunch of these different trees where we wanted to investigate life as it can be, how does life tend to evolve given the opportunity to do so, in that example, we could have asked questions like, what sorts of structures and strategies always tend to evolve on these different planets? And which structures and strategies do we only see in one or a few cases because they erode, arose because of blind chance or the specific circumstances on that planet or that environment? Perhaps in that hypothetical example, we might find that uh, cells always evolve. They're inevitable, but things like lungs and bilateral symmetry, meaning that the left side of your body looks like the right side of your body, and opposable thumbs and cerebral cortexes only evolved here on life, uh, evolved here on Earth. But on other planets, different strategies and structures evolved to support intelligent behavior. That's something we could do in that hypothetical example, and that's something we can start to do with our evolving virtual creatures here. So here we have, a, uh, as the end, at the end of this evolutionary run, we now have a complete fossil record where if we dive down into this phylogenetic tree, every single point in this tree represents an individual robot. So we might dive down and have a look at the robot in the top left if we run that video. We can analyze uh, that particular robot and understand how does it accomplish what it does. We can then move forward in the tree and look at all of the sequences of mutations that led from that robot to the robot that you'll see in the video in the middle here, which is related to but slightly different from the one you just saw. We can investigate evolution at microscopic detail, which is something that's difficult to do with biological evolution. We can look at every single evolutionary transition at any scale we like. We can move backward and forward through this phylogenetic tree. We can jump from one branch of the tree to another branch and observe this robot in the bottom left video, which has a very different body plan and a different way of moving, and we can investigate under what conditions do populations or species start to diverge and ask these uh, evolutionary questions. If we go to the next slide, um, we can not just investigate a single tree of life, but go back to the beginning, so to speak, and do another evolutionary simulation on UVM supercomputer, and go back and do a third and a fourth and a fifth. And because chance is a big part of evolution, regardless of whether we're talking about biological or computational evolution, we get different phylogenies. We get different patterns of robotic life evolving over and over again. And we can now uh, investigate this question of uh, robotic life as it can be. We can look across these different phylogenetic trees and see what sorts of structures and strategies always evolve and which are just the result of blind chance or specific circumstances. So as you saw in some of these videos, maybe we can start by evolving robots that move very quickly. Perhaps we observe, as we tend to, that these robots evolve longer legs and then eventually flexible spines and they hit on the same strategy that the big cats, like cheetahs, did that allow them to move very quickly. Maybe these fast-moving robots, we can challenge them to evolve now the ability to pick up and manipulate different objects. So perhaps some of these long legs over evolutionary time evolve into arms and then hands and then opposable thumbs like what happened with our ancestors, or perhaps something completely different happens. What if we push or evolve these robots or challenge them further to exhibit the rudiments of intelligent behavior? Perhaps we challenge them now not just to pick up different objects, but to pick up those objects and use them as a tool. They need to be able to do something with that object that they wouldn't be able to do without it. What happens if we evolve them further that they have to exhibit decision making? They have to choose between option A and B before acting. Or they need to plan ahead. Or they need to form abstractions. Perhaps we evolve them further to evolve the ability uh, of language so that they can signal amongst themselves and orchestrate their action to do something that would be beyond the ability uh, of any one of them. Assuming that is possible in the future, what would those intelligent robots look like and what would their brains look like? 
What sorts of uh, brains or nervous systems will evolve in these robots? And perhaps in the same way that some of these tools might give back to biology to allow us to study life as it could be, perhaps we could study intelligence as it could be. What sorts of nervous systems or what sorts of brain structures will support uh, intelligent behavior? Perhaps uh, further in the future, we could evolve these robots to the point where they start to exhibit intelligence uh, on a human scale. At that point, they might start to challenge us uh, to revisit the notion that humans are the only species capable of higher thought. Perhaps we would want to evolve intelligent companions. Uh, if we do, maybe we would realize that we're no longer uh, alone. Thank you.